Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for Medline Canada's sponsored presentation. I'm Shelley Maslick, Director of Clinical Engagement for Medline Canada, and I am pleased to be your moderator today. We'd like to thank Wounds Canada for this opportunity to educate at their virtual national conference. We also want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your day to join us for this presentation. Today, the Medline team is very excited that you could join us for Michelle Labby's presentation entitled, Putting Comfort and Versatility into the Wound Management Toolbox. Michelle will describe her experiences with a unique therapeutic compression option and a controlled release iodine foam dressing. Please note that any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this presentation are those of the presenter, not necessarily of Medline. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Michelle Labby. Michelle is a nurse practitioner who is passionate about complex wound management in the context of chronic disease management, particularly in people with lower leg ulcerations and diabetic foot complications. She practices in an outpatient wound clinic just outside of Edmonton and is involved in ambulatory intravenous and infusion therapy. She is especially good at providing wound and infection management education to healthcare professionals in numerous settings. This is why she is here with us today. During the presentation, I encourage you to input any questions you have for Michelle into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will collate your questions and pose as many as we can to Michelle at the end of the session. In the chat box, at the end of the session, you will notice a link where you can complete a short survey monkey with your contact information if you are interested in learning about the products you've heard about today. Now, without further ado, please welcome Michelle. Thank you, Shelley, for the introduction, and thank you all for joining us today. We're going to be discussing putting comfort and versatility in the wound management toolbox. Our objectives today are to explore therapeutic compression options, to look at a versatile controlled release iodine foam dressing that can be used beneath compression, to review a couple of clinical case studies using a two-layer compression bandage system and an iodophore foam dressing, and then lastly, uh, to facilitate hands-on clinical practice by incorporating tips and tricks into our discussion as we go. Before discussing compression, I think it's foundational that we discuss uh, why compression is necessary. Uh, edema of the lower leg is a common, uh, a common occurrence um, in many of our patients, and chronic venous insufficiency is often the most common cause of lower leg edema. Uh, and venous leg ulcers account for 80% of all the leg ulcers that we see, and they do have a, chronic, or a, a high reoccurrence rate. Chronic venous insufficiency, remember, is a chronic chronic disease. The key factors that impact venous drainage and return, um, calf muscle pump and, bail and valves in the veins regulate venous pressure of the leg, remembering that the highest venous pressure is at the ankle when a person is standing. Venous hypertension occurs when venous pressure is not regulated in the lower leg and ankle pressures remain high. There are a number of causes of venous hypertension. Those include vascular uh, reflux, failure of the calf muscle pump, or obstruction within the venous system, and we will touch on those uh, shortly. Over time, venous hypertension leads to increased permeability of capillaries, and this causes a number of changes in the skin's appearance, including hardening of the tissues. When we look at this example, we can see that we have uh, hemosiderin staining, and this is caused by leakage of red blood cells into the tissues. When venous hypertension has occurred for a prolonged period of time, um, the veins become more leaky and larger molecules and larger proteins escape, and those do include red blood cells. Red blood cells have heme or iron in them, and as they break down in the tissues, they cause this brown staining um, hemosiderin staining. Um, and this is something that is not reversible. It can sometimes fade a little bit, but this is a permanent change. You can also see uh, sort of a brawny, dense edema in the gator area. This is called lipatodermatosclerosis and is also a sign of prolonged venous hypertension. If we were to have a closer look at this person's leg in person, we may also see that they have that white marbling like, in a, like, like you see in a steak. Um, 
um, and that's called atrophy blanche. And those findings are often found in people who have chronic venous insufficiency and who have had it for uh, a long time. So malfunctioning of the valves and the veins is one of the reasons why venous hypertension occurs. Um, in, our, in, the, in the vascular system, um, the arteries do not have valves in them, but vein, uh, do not have valves in them except in the heart. However, veins do. And this helps promote venous return, that one-way return um, back through the venous system. Remembering that the pump for the venous system is different than for the arterial system, and it's, more, it's a more difficult return. And we'll talk about that as well. When we have uh, malfunctioning of, of the valves, we have a reflux or a congestion of blood left in the venous system. And this can cause that venous hypertension and that leaking of fluid into the tissues. Um, mostly when we see uh, when we see damage to those valves, it's in within the deep venous system. We have those superficial veins that we see in our legs, the varicose veins that we are that are easily visible, and then we have our deep veins, and we have the perforator veins that join those two systems. And it's within those perforator and deep veins that most of that valvular damage will occur. The cause of venous hypertension is uh, malfunction or inefficiency of the calf muscle pump. As I said, the pump for arteries is the heart. The pump for veins um, is really, of the lower legs, is that muscular contraction of the calf muscle pump. If you sit now and if you, if you do ankle turns or if you tense the muscle in the back of your leg, you can feel that large muscle contract. And that's what helps to move um, blood back through the venous system with the help of the valves that make it a one-way um, one uh, street. Um, the calf looks a lot like a bicycle, bicycle pump. That's how I think of it. Where as a person walks, we have filling and pumping that happens um, as that calf muscle pump is engaged. And so if a person doesn't have a, a really good calf muscle pump, this could be because of uh, prolonged uh, inactivity, uh, loss of mobility. Um, as a person ages, they tend not to be as active. And so that calf muscle pump isn't as efficient and we can have that venous congestion uh, develop. Another reason why we can have venous hypertension occur is because of obstruction in a system, and that would include a deep vein thrombosis. Interesting to note that 29 to 79% of patients with DVTs go on to develop some uh, form of chronic venous insufficiency due to that valvular damage, and, and because that original inflammatory process can also damage or, or cause uh, difficulties within the venous system. And so each of these causes does impact uh, venous hypertension and uh, and chronic venous insufficiency. So having discussed why uh, venous hypertension, we can now talk about how compression impacts that, ven that venous return and why it's important. Compression um, really we're, there are two forces that work together uh, to create an interface pressure between the bandage or the compression garment and the skin. And these include the resting pressure and the working pressure. And the differences between these two pressures are dynamic. And the effect that occurs really depends sometimes on the stretch of the dressing and the stiffness of the compression device. And we'll talk about that uh, incoming slides as well. But remember that compression is absolutely vital and key to reducing, treating, and preventing edema. Of, of particular note, it is really, really essential that a complete health history is done prior to putting on compression, that can, the contraindications to, contraindications to compression are considered, and that a lower leg assessment is done to determine whether peripheral arterial perfusion is adequate to support um, the application of compression. And this can sometimes be difficult. Um, ankle brachial pressure indices, toe pressures, TB BIs are done uh, to determine whether large and small vessel uh, arterial perfusion would support safe application of compression. And in many areas, this can be difficult uh, to access this testing. And, you know, depending on rural versus urban, uh, many places have wait lists. Physicians can order 
um, ABIs to be done diagnostics labs, but this does often lead to a delay in management. Um, of interest, there is uh, some research that's been done in the last number of years uh, looking at uh, whether uh, uh, a closer examination and assessment of palpable and audible pulses um, can be done to, to determine whether um, arterial perfusion would support compression. And I believe as time goes, we'll see more research come and looking at different ways that we can look at at least beginning uh, compression. But for now, we really do need to determine whether that arterial perfusion by assessment through ABI TBIs um, has been done to make sure that that application of compression is safe. So how does therapeutic compression manage chronic venous insufficiency? Really, compression helps to work against the forces of gravity and helps support that normal return of venous blood back up through the leg. 30 to 40 millimeters of uh, mercury compression is gold standard uh, for management of venous insufficiency, but remembering that's if arterial perfusion supports this. Um, and compression acts both on the venous and the lymphatic system to help reduce edema in the lower legs. And really compression comes in a number of forms. You will have seen, you know, wrapped layered compression, stocking, compression stockings or ho compression hosiery, adjustable Velcro systems, uh, intermittent pneumatic compression being used less often, but still being used, and more temporary forms of compression, including things like tube grip and edema wear. So let's talk a little bit about compression garments versus compression wraps. Compression garments are used to prevent edema rather than reduce edema. So compression garments would include pressure gradient stockings, um, and it it is really really important to that pressure gradient stockings are used to prevent edema from coming back. They're not used to reduce edema. To reduce edema, we use other forms of compression, including compression wraps. Uh, and compression wraps can be used to reduce edema and then also used to prevent edema from reoccurring. Um, along with compression wraps, sometimes those temporary forms of compression, such as uh, the tuber grips and edema wares can be used, but compression wraps remain, remain um, hugely important in, um, in our struggle to try and reduce edema and get people's legs to a dry state so that can, they can be transitioned to uh, compression uh, garments. So how do compression wraps work? Uh, compression wraps are applied at the same tension over the leg, um, and, but they exert more pressure at the ankle, and this gradually becomes less as we move up into the calf. This is impacted by the number of layers of the compression system, the degree of overlap, and the degree of tension that's applied. It's, remember, it's really important to remember that the circumference of the leg inversely affects interface pressure. Now, what does that mean? It means that the smaller the circumference or radius of curvature of the leg, the greater the interface pressure that is exerted. And the larger the circumference or radius of curvature, the smaller the interface pressure. So let's look at this and uh, have it make sense. So here we can see on the left, we have uh, legs here that are really quite consistent in shape, rather stove pipe. Um, and so if, when we apply compression wraps, we have a, a fairly consistent um, a, a fairly consistent pressure. Um, here in the middle, we have a, a relatively normal leg that we would see when we're wrapping, where we have the smaller ankle and the larger calf. Here, we can see a person who has some signs of chronic venous ins insufficiency. We can see the hemosiderin staining, um, but we see a very narrow, slim leg. Uh, we, if we were able to assess this person in person, we would notice that they probably have quite a, ta uh, quite a, a prominent um, here where we'd be able to feel the bone and they have a very narrow ankle. And so when we have this small radius of curvature, there's a greater chance of pressure damage. And so the goal in these instances is to flatten that curve and to build this up so that we have a more consistent application and aren't, aren't ending up with those high pressures at the ankle. What makes an ideal compression system? There are many things that we need to look at when we're trying to figure out uh, what might be ideal. 
patients. So an inelastic component that increases the stiffness of the system um, is ideal. It creates that massaging or squeezing effect. Um, and, you know, over the years, we've seen a real move towards an increase in the use of inelastic compression um, compression bandages. Um, and I think now we're, it's predominantly what we're using because it is a safe application. And we'll talk about those, uh, that optimized interface pressure variation within elastic um, compression in just a moment. Um, the compression system needs to be conformable to the leg, adaptable to different sizes and shapes of legs. It needs to be easy to apply and easy to consistently apply so that different health practitioners can have a consistent an application for the same patient and uh, without a lot of uh, subjectivity in that. It needs to be durable, latex free or non-allergenic, non sorry, and it needs to be comfortable when the person is resting and not cause pain. Person also needs to be able to move on, uh, to move and carry on with their usual activities and this is very important. Remember that compression does not work if the person does not buy into the management plan and truly um, we can can, we can make the best plan that we can uh, and the most optimal plan, but if the patient isn't engaged or they can't support that because of their activities of daily life or because of their choices or they simply uh, the importance, then it's really not going to work very well. So compression therapy, how do we choose what compression system would work best for our patients and, and bring us the most uh, positive patient outcomes? Things to consider when we're making that choice, peripheral arterial circulation. We need to know whether it's within normal lim limits, generally accepted as an ABI of 0.8 to 1.2. Um, but if they have optimal arterial perfusion, what are safe alternatives? We need to look at the general health status and comorbidities, and this can be really important. If we have someone who has uh, adequate peripheral arterial perfusion to support compression, but they also have COPD or congestive heart failure, we need to be conscious of where we're moving fluid uh, such that we're not moving fluid um, back into the venous system and causing uh, causing them to go into heart failure. Um, and so we need to really look at that general health status as part of deciding how we're going to apply lower limb com uh, compression. We need to look at the presence of wounds. Do we have small wounds? Do we have large circumferential, circumferential wounds? Are they placed in typical positions or are they atypical? How did they start? When did they start and, and how long have they been there? We need to look at the presence of pain and infection as well. Remembering that someone who has uh, cellulitis of the lower leg or an acute infection related to the wound, um, then that can cause an increase in pain. And so we need to consider, has this been appropriately treated? Does the person require antibiotics? How long have they been on antibiotics? And are, have, has infection been treated to the point where a safe uh, uh, compression can be applied. And it, this may, you know, also contribute to that low and slow approach to compression, where we're applying small amounts of compression to begin with and building up to more therapeutic compression as the patient is able to tolerate, um, tolerate that and their pain subsides. We need to look at edema. Where is edema and how much is it? Um, is it really edema to the, the uh, ankles and lower leg? Does it extend up into thigh? Does it extend up into the groin? Looking at the whole person, do they have edema in their other extremities? And is this edema related to chronic venous insufficiency? Is it related to something else or is it because of a combination uh, of factors? We need to look at skin hygiene. Uh, what is the person's cleanliness like? Are they, are, are they incontinent? Somewhat that you're going to put in, into compression wraps and leave them on for say three to four to seven days and who is actively incontinent can really contaminate those. We need to look at that and address it. We also need to address stasis dermatitis or contact dermatitis and whether that's uh, present and how we might address that moving forward. We need to look at the person's adherence to a health management plan. Are they able to tolerate compression? Are they in engaged in their care? Uh, and what are their social supports? Um, are you, is this someone that you can see in their home? Are they able to travel to clinics? Um, are they able to drive? Um, and, and what is their social support system like? 
So when we look um, at the person, we've done a lower leg assessment, we deem that we're going to move forward with uh, compression therapy for a venous leg ulcer, uh, such as uh, is present here in the middle of our screen. How are we going to approach that decision making? We may have different ideas, we may have availability of different systems. Um, for instance, we may have a person that we're seeing on a Friday afternoon where wrapped compression may be really what's indicated, uh, but because we don't have uh, the ability to change compression systems or, or to have staff rev readily available over a weekend, we may choose a temporary uh, compression system such as a, a tubic grip or demoware over a weekend and then begin with wrap compression early in the week. So looking at the different attributes of, how, of the patient and how what the health team feels would be uh, a good approach to management. So we can come up with a, a, an optimal plan and how we want to move forward with that. However, we need to always remember that the individual is at the heart of that plan. And we each individual has their own considerations that we need to take into account. It may be that they need to work uh, and wear work boots and they're worried that they can't get the compression system into the work boot. Uh, they may feel they don't that, that they need to come in for appointments or to, to have compression wraps changed. They may be planning on traveling. They may uh, have different activities that they want to engage in. That they're worried that compression wraps or any form of compression may get in the way of that. When we think of this summer, um, it was very hot out uh, in Alberta. It was very, very hot, and I think across the country. And so when we had temperatures in the mid to high 30s or or even higher, uh, people were very reluctant to have compression wraps on if they didn't have an air conditioned system at home. And so we need to keep that in mind and to sort of blend the individual's considerations with the health management team's plan and to come up with a mutually uh, agreeable plan moving forward. So when uh, in do lots of compression management in people with chronic venous insufficiency. Um, I've always been very uh, uh, interested and engaged in trying many different products. I feel that we can move our practice forward by looking at different products as they come out. It's really important to try new things, but it's also important to try them within the context of what's uh, agreeable in the health setting. So always making sure that, you know, management and, and um, central supply areas are engaged in those trials so that you can give appropriate feedback and, and move forward with technologies as they come out. So we decided, uh, we had a look at AccuRap and decided to do a product trial with that. It is a two layer short stretch or inelastic compression bandage system. It's thin and streamlined, um, uh, thin and streamlined layering, very sturdy and breathable. It's 100% polyester. It does have an accuracy indicator, which I'll show you. It has a slightly cohesive texture that helps it stay in place. Um, it has is really uh, fabulous packaging so that there's clinician and patient instructions on the box and I'll show you those. Um, and the only uh, caveat when you're looking at that is that we have to ensure that the ankle circumference is 18 centimeters or more. And if not, that circumference must be built up. Now remember back to looking at um, the interface pressures when the, the ankle is too small or when we have those, those more, those sharper curvatures and having to flatten that curve. And this relates to that as well. So if we have that very small ankle uh, with this system and with any, making sure that we're building up so we're not having ankle pressures too high. A little uh, a closer look um, at Accurat. Um, and the inelastic uh, component of that. So um, like, like most of our compression wraps that we're currently using, uh, AccuRap is a short stretch compression system. And why is that effective? When we look at the resting pressures of short stretch versus long stretch, um, we can look at, uh, yeah, you know, a short stretch, we have 
lower resting pressure. So that means when the compression wrap is on the lower leg and a person is at rest and their calf pump isn't activated, either when they're um, sitting with their legs elevated or a non-ambulatory, then their resting pressures are low. So making the system more comfortable. As a person actively engages their calf pump with walking, we can see that we have a, an increase in that interfra uh, interface pressure in that squeezing, massaging of the veins to help with venous return. And then when a person returns to resting, we have low restroom pressures. So we have a real uh, dynamic effect that occurs between resting and ambulating. With the elastic or long stretch compressions, uh, we can see that we have higher resting pressures and lower um, um, working pressures. And so we have uh, um, a less of a dynamic effect. And uh, there may be uh, certain circumstances we, where we may choose that, uh, but uh, the inelastic compression uh, is found to be the most comfortable with the uh, best dynamic um, effect occurring. So when we look at Accurap itself, there are three different kits that it comes in. It comes in a regular, which is 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury, an Accurap XL, uh, which is really very handy because it has the longer length for larger and longer legs, and then also coming in Accurap light, which is 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury. So let's go over some of the attributes of Accurap that I mentioned. One of these is the accuracy indicator for consistent application. And so what we have is as you're stretching the outer component, um, then what we're doing is bringing that inner square or that inner uh, rectangle to a square so that it, we have that consistent application um, and we have that visual to assist. And that is with the 50% uh, overlap. Accurap also has a slightly cohesive texture, uh, which is really very nice and it helps the system to stay in place during application. And so what I've done here is just take a couple pictures of how, during application and you can see with the soft, uh, the soft inner wrap, uh, it has a slightly stretchy uh, um, slightly stretchy component to it. So it's not that you're applying compression, but it conforms nicely to the leg. And when you cut it, it just stays in place. You don't require tape. And it's the same with the outer layer. Um, you can actually stop during application uh, and it'll just stay there without rolling or unrolling. So it's highly, really convenient if you're wanting to reposition the leg on the bolster or if you're needing re to reposition the patient in any way, uh, very handy that way. You're also able to make slight adjustments. And this is kind of, it's very, it's actually very cool. Um, I did a little video to show you how this happens. Uh, and so I'm gonna let you watch that here in just a moment. <laughs> oh, that's funny, hilarious. I love it. <laughs> So you can see that you can lift and reposition uh, in a number of areas. And, and actually you can teach your patient themselves if they have a little area that's biting, that they can lift it and reposition it and actually um, find that it, it works quite well for them as well. When we look at the packaging for Accurap, it's actually really, really very nice. So what Midland has done is they've put the instructions for application on the side of the box. So that is a good review for the uh, for the the health practitioner who's applying the compression. It's a good reminder for uh, consistency. And inside the flap, there is a rip off or tear away patient education card. Again, a good reminder to go over the uh, compression therapy plan for the patient and to review those instructions. So we're going to look at a couple of case studies um, for, uh, of patients that we trialed Accurap um, on. And so this is Scott, he's 66 years old. You can see he's a hunter, a fisher, and he likes traveling. He has a long history of chronic venous insufficiency with intermittent ulcerations. He's also a very tall guy. I've probably uh, seen him uh, over the course of at least 15 years, so know him well. He wears uh, 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury pressure 
signature gradient stockings. Uh, he wears them regularly. Um, as with a lot of people, he'll have periods of time where he doesn't, for instance, when he's on a warm vacation, and, and he does keep them up to date. He has experience with a wide variety, variety sorry, of multi-layer compression wraps, uh, having tried pretty much everything that's been available over the last uh, 15 or so years that we've been seeing him. He came to see us last fall uh, with a new wound to his shin. He had, uh, as you can see, this uh, wound here to the right. Uh, he had also some minor skin breakdowns down in the gator area as well, but this was just about uh, 10 centimeters below his kneecap. And so a bit of an atypical presentation. So despite best care, uh, that wound did not want to close. It sort of um, would almost close over, then it would open again. It would almost close over, it would open again. Um, and this was rather atypical and is not really the usual area for venous stasis ulcers. Usually we find them here in the uh, gator area, medial, medial or lateral, lateral malleolus. Sometimes we'll find them higher, particularly if they're related to uh, trauma. So he was referred to dermatology and a biopsy was done uh, and it was found that this was a basal cell carcinoma. And so he was referred uh, for a Mohs procedure. What is a most procedure? A most procedure is done uh, predominantly by dermatology. It requires special equipment, so there's not that many dermatologists that do it. And what they do is this can take a number of hours, two, three, four, five hours to do these procedures, because the idea is to remove the lesion, test the borders for malignancy, and continue to take small areas away until all the borders are free and clear. It's often done in areas, um, particularly say on the face, where you really want to take as little tissue as possible possible. And so you can see that he was and he was left with a full thickness wound. It was left to heal by secondary intent. You can see blood vessels in the bottom of this wound. You can see a little bit of a, a, a tendon here. Uh, and in fact, this would move um, when he moved his leg. And so um, the decisions regarding compression options were left to the clinicians because um, really uh, he came with just a bandage, no compression at all post-op. Edema management for this patient remained a concern. Just because he's had an acute uh, surgical procedure doesn't mean that the chronic venous insufficiency doesn't need to be treated. In fact, it's even it's as or more important than before. We must continue to treat that chronic venous insufficiency, but we need to consider that his leg was now more swollen because he'd had recent uh, recent surgical procedure. He had increased pain in that area, and he really couldn't tolerate his regular compression stockings because they were just too tight. Remember that compression stockings are meant to prevent edema. They're not meant to reduce edema. And so these were no longer an option for him. So a decision was made to restart uh, wrapped compression. The surgeon was consulted in agreement with that. And the patient was amenable to trying uh, the new compression system that we were trial trialing at that time, that being Accurap. So we began using Accurap XL for him. And that is that extra long kick. Um, and it worked very, uh, very well for him because he's uh, quite tall. So uh, Scott was in his compression wrap. Uh, he came back and he had some feedback for us and I wanted to share that with you. Um, and this, he did this on his own and, and shared this freely. So I'm going to let to, you just listen to this brief video. Oh. Okay, the new wrap that they put on my leg last week is exceptionally, a thousand percent more comfortable than the Woohoo! And it uh, stays tight doesn't move around. It's very, very good. So there you have it. Um, and so he was very happy with the AccuRap and wanted to continue with this uh, ongoing. So just to follow his wound, uh, of course, it was important that we kept that wound base uh, moist because there was uh, there were blood vessels and tendons there. As he, we used a variety of different dressings, and as he moved towards healing, you can see that um, here by April 9th, he was transitioned to his own pressure gradient stockings as he was going on a vacation. Um, and at this point, his edema was in it at a dry state. He, he, he so his compression stockings would prevent the edema from coming back, and he progressed to full closure uh, of that wound following that. A second case study, 
uh, is with this 57 year old lady. Uh, she works as a cook in a restaurant. So on her legs, a lot of the time, she has a very large family with six children, very busy with them and with her grandchildren, uh, often doesn't have time to take care of herself. She has extensive chronic venous insufficiency, predominantly of the right leg. She has a history of acute DVT in that leg and a history of pulmonary emboli. And remember that we spoke about the causes there or the reasons why venous hypertension and chronic venous insufficiency can develop. And, it, and deep vein thrombosis is one of those causes, that, th that obstruction of the venous system. And so she has been uh, in compression wraps many times, has a long history of recurrent leg ulcers requiring prolonged periods of treatment uh, with compression wraps. She has known stasis dermatitis with numerous skin sensitivities. As we know, people who have had chronic venous insufficient insufficiency, sorry, for a long period of time are more prone to skin sensitivity and allergies. And she was referred to us again uh, for a recurrent leg ulcer in December of 2020. And again, she's a long time um, a patient known to myself. She initially required acute infection management systemically. She was on IVs for a period of time uh, to get this leg settled down. So uh, once that was settled, we decided, uh, we approached her about trialing the Accurap. Uh, she was amenable to that. She'd used iodine with success for a number of um, a number of episodes of ulceration. And so we also uh, asked her about trialing a new iodine dressing that we were uh, using and that being Ioplex. And we'll talk a little bit about Ioplex um, to give you some information on that as well, because we were trialing the two products at the same time, the Accurap and the Ioplex. So Ioplex is an iodophore foam dressing. Um, it's intended to help clean up wet ulcers and wounds. Uh, it can be it's indicated for infected wounds as well, including traumatic burns and surgical wounds. Um, it is not, uh, contraindications include not being used in the eyes, which really is one of those common sense things. Uh, and also to use, uh, not to use or use with caution in patients with a history of thyroid disease and not to use in pregnant or lactating women. So Ioplex is a iodine foam. Um, it has a PVA foam that manages a large amount of exudate. Uh, one of the reasons why we chose it for this lady because she had a large amount of exudate. So it wicks away well and it comes in a pre-moistened um, in a pre-moistened state. Um, it has the iodophore part of it, and iodophore is the vehicle for carrying iodine. And it means that the iodoph iodophore vehicle carries the iodine and allows for slow release of that iodine as needed. So it's an on-demand release of iodine versus that dumping of iodine, which we would see if we use something like betadine. Uh, and so often iodine and a betadine or uh, form is uh, more of a cytotoxic um, solution, but when combined with an iodoph uh, iodophore vehicle, um, then it is released over time, much like the other um, uh, iodine dressings that we see, they're bound in a way that it's slow release. And it is safe um, in that way because it reduces that cytotoxicity. So besides that annual um, efficacy of Iod Ioplex, it all, there are also other advantages. One is extended wear time. It can be left in place for up to three days, but Ioplex can be cut and stacked um, so that you get a longer wear time uh, and it can be used under compression that way. And it also changes color. So it, it goes on, it's a really charcoal black and as the iodine is released it turns white in color it's easy and quick to apply and remove it if a person if you're using a piece of Ioplex and not using the entire dressing, but saving the rest of it for that same patient, uh, for instance, in their home. If it dries out, it can be easily um, moistened with saline again. Uh, it's very pliable and very soft. It's also compatible with Santal. So Santal is a collagenase uh, enzymatic debrider and so can be used with that as well. 
The packaging, again, is really, um, really fantastic. It includes instructions for the practitioner on the box and on the dressing itself. And here you can see a picture of Ioplex in its sort of uh, a foil pouch, uh, and it is very, very soft and easy to cut. So here um, we have uh, some follow-up for the patient. Uh, we have the dressing having been put on. You can see that we have uh, the dressing used up here in the middle with good exudate um, uh, absorption. Of course, a cover dressing was put over this to soak up that drainage. You can see where the uh, Ioplex was, iodine was not released. And here I uh, have included a short video of, of how Ioplex comes off, uh, just so you can see sort of, um, you know, where it sticks, where it doesn't, and how easy it actually is to take off. So I'm going to play that for you now. I'm, getting, I'm video taking it off. All right, so you can see that it, it actually comes off very easily. The um, black um, portions of the Ioplex don't become crispy and hard uh, and are easy to re uh, to re moisten for uh, removal. And we were really happy with how that cleaned up. And so was she. She found it comfortable and she found that it, you know, we do very wound issues, which had been historically one of her uh, problems. So here we follow the wound through, and by March 2nd, we are having a decreased exudate, um, and so uh, at that point, transition to another dressing. However, um, she experienced uh, peri-wound irritation and breakdown from other dressings that we tried, and she asked if she could please go back to the Ioplex, even though it is for um, higher exuding wounds, and uh, so we decided to try that with her. And so we uh, did use the Ioplex and you can see we used it ongoing until we reached this point where she is very, very close to wound closure. Um, really, we found that with the uh, low exudate, it still worked really well. You can see this has been on for uh, three to four days under the compression. She's been wrapped twice a week. Um, and you can see that the iodine still appears black. Uh, here we have a little bit of white but off easily and works well. And really underneath you would see, you'll see that the iodine or the Ioplex turns white. And so I have included a picture of another patient trial just to show you how that works. Again, this is a diabetic foot ulcer at the end of a toe. You can see that after uh, dressing removal that the Ioplex has remained black, indicating that the iodine has not been released. However, when you take the dressing off, you can see in the shape of the wound that the uh, dressing has turned white, indicating that it's been released. So some feedback from patients and clinicians on Accurap and on Ioplex. Uh, patients found that it was more comfortable than other wraps, less bulky, fit into the shoe better. It was cooler and didn't feel so hot. And it was they were able to adjust it a little, as I showed you earlier in being able to lift the edge a little bit and reposition uh, wrinkles or areas that seemed to be pinching. Uh, clinicians found that edema was further improved compared to over pre the previous reps that had been trialed on these patients, that that improved edema reflected in an increase in wound exudate and improved skin integrity, that the Accurap was easy to apply consistently. And in fact, they uh, often uh, um, commented that it was actually fun to apply and it actually is. The XL size was very convenient for larger long legs, and it's able to make minor adjustments to the wrap. And remembering that this wrap is intended to be applied in one piece circumferentially. So it is uh, the, the ability to make those minor adjustments is, is really uh, um, a good attribute um, in able, being able to reposition as you're applying. For Ioplex, patients found that it was comfortable, it didn't sting, seemed to be the only dressing that my skin could tolerate, um, and that being uh, for a number of patients who had really a difficult um, 
difficult wounds and peri wound skin to address because of sensitivities and allergies from beginning to end, which was something that we were surprised about. Clinicians found it was easy to use. It can be stacked for that extended wear time. In fact, we've stacked it up to three or four uh, layers uh, thick, making sure that you're always documenting how many layers you're putting in. It's easily, easily rehydrated with saline, absorbs drainage very well. It's effective even when the drainage subsides. Peri-wound health was improved, uh, and it cleaned up the wound bed very well with increased granulation evident. It really really did seem to uh, really assist with that autolytic debridement. Um, and it doesn't break apart, it was easily removed. And in fact, we've used it into small areas um, where we needed to lightly pack and have had effect with that as well. Uh, of interest this summer, I, I, I Allison in, in our facility, and she was there for another appointment. Uh, this is the lady that we had the Accurap and the uh, Ioplex used. You can see that she uses Velcro compression, um, and she doesn't use compression over the foot, but is finding that she has uh, good um, prevention of further ulceration using the compression. So I thought it was interesting to show that she remained, um, remained closed and uh, was uh, continuing on with her life as desired. So in summary, the individual with the wound is the most important member of the team. Individual needs need to be addressed to help ensure positive outcomes. We need to remember that compression is a lifelong commitment. Uh, it may require changes in our strategies as time goes, but uh, patient education and patient support of self-care are vital in supporting that lifelong commitment and prevention of ulceration uh, ongoing. We always need to consider what tools we have in our toolbox. We need to be informed consumers, read evidence, ask questions, try new products for yourself. Don't believe what other people tell you. Be willing to try things on your own and to do that objectively. Um, avoid flavor of the day wound management plans. It seems if we go to an in-service on a certain product, then everyone's in that product. And then we go to a different in-service and somebody else's, then we're using that. Um, and so I, I encourage you to look at the person to look at their individual needs and to come up with a plan uh, for that person's needs and based on the desired patient outcomes established by the team. Remember, there's no I in team. Always work together, network, talk to each other, use your colleagues uh, where you work and in other places, access resources, and be willing to think outside the box. I do mention the Wound Canada uh, product pet, the Wounds Canada product picker, sorry, for the control of venous leg edema. This is something that's available on the Wounds Canada website uh, and can be a really valuable um, tool for the health, health provider team to look at and to uh, do some education with and to put the products that you have there um, into them to come up with those individualized plans. So I will end my presentation with my favorite quote, and that is, the mark of a well-educated person is not knowing all the answers, but knowing where to find them. So I challenge you to ask questions, to always look for the answers that you need, and to be well-informed. I thank you for your attention today, and I'm happy to entertain questions. Well, on behalf of Medline Canada, we'd like to thank you, Michelle, for sharing your experiences with these unique dressings. They will be a nice addition to anyone's wound management toolbox. Now let's get to your questions. There was many of them. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Deanna Lundstrom, Clinical Director of Skin Health Division, and she will be sharing the questions uh, that we received during Michelle's presentation. If we don't get to all the questions, we'll send the answers and questions out as a follow-up. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you, Shelley. The first question I'd like to ask that's come through Michelle is with respect to some of the case studies you were showing on leg ulcers. The question is from Monique. What is the thick hard scale found on these lower legs around the ankle and how do you safely remove or manage this? To describe it, it is hard gray and cracked looking and it seems fused to the skin. It is not eschar. It is like crocodile skin. 
Um, I think what you're talking about is um, stasis dermatitis uh, related to long-term edema and chronic venous insufficiency. Uh, there's lots of different ways to look at, uh, at approaching that. Um, good wound hygiene, good skin hygiene, and compression really helps with that. So as you, if, as you safely apply compression, if they have peripheral arterial circulation to support that, then with good skin and wound hygiene and with the compression, that will begin to start to lift. And so as part as compression um, progresses, edema is managed, and that skin hygiene uh, improves, then that can be, it'll often just sort of flake away. There's different ways of approaching that as well with regards to compression and using uh, things like um, paste bandages, like visco paste and, and different things along the way. There's never just one way of approaching things. There's many different ways. So I would encourage you to reach out to your other clients clinicians, to your team, to your local wound specialist to come up with a plan, because I think that's really important. But you can have really good outcomes uh, by approaching that uh, with a number of different strategies. But at compression and good skin and wound hygiene are really important for that. Thank you, Michelle. The second question comes from Allison Stack. When a person sits or rests primarily with legs elevated, do short stretch wraps provide adequate compression? Um, thanks, Allison. If you think back to the slide where I had um, the short stretch and long stretch being compared um, on a curve, when a person with inelastic uh, or short stretch compression has that applied and at rest, there is still some compression there, not as much if they're, as if they're in a long stretch, but there is still some compression. And so where what becomes important then is if you have someone who's uh, quite sedentary or not moving a lot, is to actually to teach them strategies to activate that calf pump when they're at rest, uh, doing ankle circles, using uh, you know therapeutic bands to do uh, to do ankle exercises or a towel, and so that will also even at rest increase those pressures by activating that calf pump. So I hope that answers your question. Long stretch will give more compression at rest, but again, we have to look at the safety and the efficacy and, and the the comfort of that as well. Excellent, thank you. And from Virginia. Could you confirm that if inelastic bandage applied around the ankle is less than 18 centimeters circumference, that this could contribute to increased wound pain and inflammation of the wound? Uh, that's a really good question, Virginia. And yes, if you have small ankle circumferences and you aren't addressing that by building up the ankle um, with uh, batting or whatever, you know, primary layer you're using uh, for the, your compression system, um, you can have increased pain uh, and with pain inflammation as well. And so it's important to build that up. And I've seen that where uh, we have patients with pain, you know, very painful ulcers and people who have uh, long term term uh, venous stasis, and particularly with lipatodermatosclerosis and atrophy blanche, do have a lot more pain. And if we can build up those tiny ankles um, to 18 centimeters or more, then that is often very helpful. But also remember that pain can be a sign of other things like infection. So it's doing looking at that whole comprehensive assessment of each patient. Thank you. And the last question as it pertains to your presentation on compression therapy is can, from Ola, can you please discuss the loss of calf, calf muscle pump due to extended use of compression and how do you mitigate this complication? It's an, it's an interesting question because um, I would ask, um, I haven't seen that, um, but I would ask if you're seeing loss of calf muscle um, when application, when compression has been used for a long time, and I'm not sure if this is wrap compression or venous chronic, you know, or pressure gradient stockings, but why is that loss of calf muscle pump because, or calf muscle, because if they're in compression, we shouldn't have that. We're actually giving um, the comp uh, wrapped compression or com compression stockings is actually giving something um, for the muscle to work against. And so we shouldn't be losing um, muscle structure or function or, or the amount of muscle that's there. In fact, we should be maintaining it or increasing it. And so I would ask, why is this, what setting are you finding this in? Are these patients that are quite sedentary? Uh, are there other things going on? And look at that whole medical management to see what is actually going on. And are you actually losing 
um, calf muscle, or is it just that the edema is coming down and now you're actually seeing uh, what was there to begin with? And so I think that that is a really excellent question. And I think it needs to be explored more. Um, and I would talk to your wound specialist and, and, and um, ask more questions. Then you can pose those questions um, at the Medline booth as well. Um, but that's a really interesting question. It really is, it brings more questions to mind than actually it does answers. Excellent. That Thank you sense. so much. <laughs> Thank you for that, Michelle. Now, with respect to your uh, case studies and your presentation on the IOPLEX, can you please explain um, if, since it is PVA foam, can it be used under negative pressure wound therapy? That's very interesting as well. Um, got some really good critical thinkers uh, uh, online, so that is is kind of fun. Um, but the, it is not contraindicated be beneath compression, or I mean between. Uh, okay, sorry, it's not contraindicated be beneath negative pressure wound therapy, um, and so it has been used beneath negative pressure wound therapy. I had personally have not done so. Um, as I said, we're fairly new into using IOPLEX and it is something that I would definitely consider. It's not contraindicated um, when by the company. And so again, that's a really good question to go online and pose to Medline so that they can answer that more thoroughly for you. Um, because that, you know, we always look outside the box uh, and to see where we can use things in different uh, situations and different with different kinds of patients. And the more experience we have, the more uh, we are comfortable to ask those sorts of questions and consider using things outside of the box. But again, always being cognizant that you have to go to the manufacturer of whatever dressing you're wanting to use uh, in a sort of off-label uh, situation to see if that's something that's been done before it's safe and that there's no contraindications. So thank you for that. That was interesting. And the very last question for the session today, Michelle, uh, would be looking at the foam, depending on the drainage amount, how long can the foam be left in place? Well, the official company line is up to seven days. But again, we all know that it depends on how many layers of the foam that you have that you're stacking. Uh, it depends on the amount of drainage and remembering that when we're applying wrapped compression, we're expecting increased drainage because we're moving fluid. And so it'll also come out path of least resistance and we'll have increased wound drainage as well. And so, um, you know, I've used a number of layers um, beneath wrapped compression, um, two to three layers. And it's quite interesting because it turns white at the interface and then the next layer turns white and the next layer. And indeed, as you've seen from the pictures with low, uh, using Ioplex with low exudate, um, it turns white closest to the wound and then moves up. And so it depends on really how many layers you're using and how you're using that. Um, but it does seem to work very well. And we had really good clinical outcomes and we'll continue to try it in different sorts of patients. We've used it with diabetic foot ulcers. We've used it um, with acute wounds. Uh, we've used it with some tunneling wounds uh, and, and had really uh, interesting results with that. So good question, but company line is up to seven days, but we know that that depends uh, on many factors. But it, in the case of wrapped compression, sometimes we're leaving patients up to a week. Uh, and in that case, using Ioplex to, you know, based on what you assess with the wound and the patient can be left in place for up to a week as well. Thank you, Michelle. And on to you, Shelley. Well, thanks, Michelle, and some great questions. Wow, I don't know if you got through them all, but um, we are open, uh, our booth is open, so please feel free to visit our booth. And as I say, we will follow up with the questions that were unanswered as well. So on behalf of all of us at Medline, Michelle, we'd like to thank you uh, for sharing your expertise on the use of therapeutic compression and your positive experiences with Accurap and Ioplex. Thanks again to all of you in the audience for taking the time uh, today to attend the sessions. If we didn't get to your questions, please visit us again at the Medline booth in the chat room. We will be there live to answer any of your questions. I'd also like to encourage you to visit the Wounds Canada chat room. And as a reminder, Medline's short survey monkey has appeared in the chat box. Please also take the time to complete the Wounds Canada session evaluation by copying and pasting the link into your browser. Please enjoy the rest of the conference and thanks again for attending. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you.